Hello, Rufus King Nation. This is Anthony Lauer, art and design teacher at Rufus King High School, and you're listening to episode 12 of The King's Cast, a podcast introducing our listeners to the men and women working each day to teach the next generation of Rufus King generals. Today, we're talking about counseling with Brenda Michael, one of Rufus King High School's dedicated counselors in our guidance department. In our conversation, we will discuss how the International Baccalaureate Program aims to develop King students into inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring individuals who strive to create a better and more peaceful world. Thanks for taking a few minutes to listen today. Good afternoon, Ms. Michael. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks for coming down to record the uh, episode 12 of the King's Cast. You're welcome. So, as I mentioned in the intro, you are one of our guidance counselors. Um, I know over the years I've picked up on counseling or counselors being said more than guidance. Was there a shift somewhere along the way? Sorry to add a question in, but I am curious. No, that there was a shift um, about five years ago. The American School Counselors Association shifted from calling us guidance counselors to school counselors. Um, it's, a, it's been a hard shift because people were so used to guidance counselors, but um, we are officially called school counselors now. I try my best to remember <laughs> that, but I've never stopped to ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thanks for clearing that up, and I hope that helps clear it up for the uh, 20 or so listeners of the podcast. <laughs> uh, so let's start off with what brought you to Rufus King High School? Well, that's... Um, Quite a long story that many alumni probably remember Dr. Jim Kroll, who um, was the former King Counseling Director, and I worked at a school at the time, it was called School of Entrepreneurship, In um, I worked there from 94 to 99, and um, we would have these counseling meetings together from the different schools, and Dr. Kroll approached me one day and said, hey, why don't you apply to King? We need a half counselor, half social studies teacher. So when I came in the year 2000, I was part-time counseling and part-time U.S. history. Interesting, do you have dual licensures? Is that how this came about? Yep, I do have dual licensure, so, It was a unique position that I kind of fell into. Um, So I left School of Entrepreneurship, which um, was a difficult move because I was there when the school opened. So a lot of work went into opening that school, um, and it was a very small school. So leaving a school of 100 students to 1,500 students was a transition, but I have never looked back, and I've been here since 2000 um, as starting then as part teacher part counselor moved into full-time counseling and um, it's been great you know that's the one thing I've enjoyed over these last 12 episodes is asking that first question um, and most often more often than not the teachers that I've interviewed so far do ask or talk about how they got here um, but I just like Mr. Joseph talked about how he was just, I think, a security officer uh, before he decided that he wanted to do more with his life and then moved into teaching and then moved into running uh, TOK with Mr. Gatewood and kind of this trans- transition through coming to King, I mean, getting to King as a teacher, but then also not necessarily looking back. And I think that does speak volumes to the school. I say it almost every episode. This is not meant to be an advertisement. It's not meant to be, hey, King. It's just meant to point out. Uh, Teachers volunteer to be on this show, and they just all happen to so far have loved their experiences here at King. Mm -hmm. And we try to use that every day to build this school uh, further into the future and to bring our students through this program and help them feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. I think the best answer was uh, Josh Anderson talked about being in a band prior to getting into teaching and literature. Oh, sure. I would, yeah. I, I do have I a know, Gatewood, story. I'm sorry. Gatewood was in like the band. band. I forgot what Josh Joseph, or Anderson did before he started here. I can see Gatewood being in a band. Um, I do have a funny interview story for my interview at King. Um, I came in and I was pregnant when I interviewed. And so this is why I never forget how long I've been at King because I gave birth to my daughter one hour after my King interview. Holy cow. (laughs) 
Yeah. That's bursting at the Went seams. Went home and said, we got to go. And, and that was she's now there. 23 years old. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say 2000 and now. That's wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I, uh, my firstborn, uh, it was a night we were supposed to have conferences, I think. My wife and I and my sister all worked at the same school. I had to do play rehearsals for the spring musical, fall? No, maybe for the fall show. And so I was in rehearsals. My sister and wife went out to Noodles to get dinner before conferences, or I don't even know if it's conferences or open house. But uh, I get the call that her water broke in the Noodles, and uh, my sister took her to the hospital, and I rushed out of rehearsal, and there were three less teachers at yep, open house that yep. night. Um, yeah, it's always fun to have a good story like that, yeah, and that's a good memory yeah. to connect you back to King. It sure is. How do you incorporate the IB into your job here at Rufus King? Well, the biggest part of where it fits into my job is um, when students apply to college, they have to submit a copy of their schedule and colleges have shared with us over the years that yes GPA is important and yes there's a place for test scores but really what holds a lot of credence with these colleges is the rigor of what they're taking in high school Um, so we share that with students that the IB courses um, are are shared with the colleges. And they know that a lot of our seniors to just meet the basic uh, high school graduation requirements maybe only need English for that final fourth year. But we like to tell our students that it's the IB, um, four years of math, four years of science, the you know IB courses tell the colleges that they're going over and beyond the bare minimum. So that's a big uh, way it fits into our job. Um, I've also had students come back and share that, you know, they go to college or even if they go to into the work world or wherever they end up, um, they see what other students have don't know how don't know what to do. They've gone to college and said, I know how to write a paper and you know, some of my college housemates or roommates didn't even, had never written a paper. So that's another place it um, prepares. It also prepares for the ACT, that rigor, um, the ACT's curriculum base. So the more content you have, the better your scores will be. So, so I have a lot of thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that were flying through my brain. And now the last one, which is the one that'll probably get me in trouble. (laughs) Um, Talking about that rigor with ACT, Mm -hmm. you know, there's been the shift in the 10 years I've been at Rufus King um, that our final exams have morphed into this final opportunity for evidence or to show proficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just finished today, not Mm -hmm. an hour and a half ago, two hours ago. Uh, So it's the last day of semester one Mm -hmm. um, while we're recording this episode. But um, there's that idea that we're still judged based on high stakes cumulative test that the world for the most part still holds people accountable. Driver's test, entrance exams, workplace competencies Mm -hmm. are all kind of this cumulative high stakes test that's make it or break it. And yeah, sometimes you can retake it, but there are always consequences to retaking those in in the day-to-day lives. Um, I had that conversation. This was my whole conversation two weeks ago leading up to exemptions with my freshmen. Mm -hmm. I have three classes, majority freshmen. I rarely have that. And I really wanted to let them know, especially because most of the middle school was COVID related. Mm -hmm. um, You're not in middle school anymore. Our grades are still standardized, are standards based, I should say, but it does matter what you do. And I want you guys to work towards this exemption because it boosts your grade. Mm -hmm. And then the following week after I had put out exemptions, I said to my freshmen again, guys, you have one more week. You might not have made exemption, but let's work towards this final exam. Mm -hmm. You might not know it now, but everything gets averaged. It didn't happen in middle school, but your first standard all the things we did in that get averaged to this one score. Then all four standards get averaged to make your grade. And then all seven of your classes get averaged to make your first semester GPA. Mm -hmm. And that GPA adds to second semester and makes your freshman year and so on and so forth. And even Mm -hmm. though GPA is one aspect of who a person is, and I'll get into a second idea I had based on your answer about IB and, and what college is looking for, it is important to remember that these things 
do follow you and you can show that you put your best foot forward. And I think that dovetails on your comment about the rigor in junior and senior year. But let's not have to work too hard junior and senior year if you keep trying to make up a low GPA from your freshman year. Mm -hmm. um, but then to transition through the skills they get here, not just academically, um, it's that learner profile that gives them the soft skills as well. I've had students come back and talk about that same idea that talking to a professor, they felt more comfortable going to talk to their professor because they could talk to their teachers. Right. And they learned those soft skills here somewhat connected to the learner profile. Or they knew how to interact and have conflict resolution with their roommate. Mm -hmm. um, or they knew how to help and offer those study guidance because they went through... Um, our freshman bridge and they became student leaders or they got into student government and so they could go back and help their classmates or their roommates in college do that stuff or knew how to talk to the boss right. about getting a raise or have an uncomfortable conversation about a coworker that might not be working up to par. Um, so I think all three of those things filter into making the generals that we're making. Right, um, right. Yeah, I had other thoughts, but this isn't about me. I right. sometimes go off on a tangent. But no, I, I mean, a lot. It, there's a lot said for self-advocacy skills and that kind of thing to, um, you know, ask for what you need, ask for help, you know, be comfortable talking to adults. Those soft skills are huge. Yeah, and those are the soft skills I felt this semester is really is pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. Guys, do you have any questions? No? Okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to start pulling up some stuff. I have two people that wanted help with something, but then again, find me, ask mm -hmm. those questions. Mm -hmm. or I'll circle the room to introduce myself to the table to help the kids pull through. And I've seen other teachers obviously do that, but that's what we do here is try to make the students feel welcome and, and, and feel comfortable with their putting us down as their first choice right. um, in MPS. Right, yeah. Do you have a favorite aspect to your job working with students? Um, I, I love any interaction I have face-to-face -face with students. I um, didn't do well like so many other people during the pandemic, being virtual, looking at screens was not my thing. Um, however, any time I can sit down with a student and they can share with me and I've seen how they've grown over four years, I love when students come back after they graduate. I love to hear um, what they're doing. I, um, I do not like as much like the scheduling, the paper, the computer type work. Definitely the more face-to-face -face interactions with students um, has been great. We've also been trying to get into classrooms more, um, to teach some of those soft skills, those social emotional lessons that we have. And I've really enjoyed that. I mean, coming from a teaching background, it's it's kind of like the best of both worlds. One reason I pulled out of teaching a little bit is I felt that um, students, I, I felt torn between not being able to always help students the way I felt I should with some of the so social emotional concerns they have because your teaching load is so overloaded yeah. and you just didn't have the time. Um, so that's kind of what drew me into counseling. But having said that, it's also been great to get back into the classroom a little bit and have that experience. That's one of the questions I didn't put down here because I wasn't quite sure where you have landed over the last couple of years post pandemic, but you do advise uh, different student organizations. And I would think that this would be an opportunity to connect with that. Uh, mm -hmm. What you just said is, do you want to talk a little bit about your roles in whichever student organizations you are now with? Cause sure. it, it's, it's fluctuated over the 10 years I've known you. It, it has fluctuated. <clears throat> um, last year I advised NHS. And I did that because coming out of the pandemic, it, we couldn't find anyone to do it. So I did not want to see that be set aside. So I, I did do that last year. Um, this year, Mr. Schaefer and Ms. Curry have graciously taken that over. So that's been a huge godsend. But um, I've also taken on a group that a former counselor at King introduced me to, and it's called Regen. And it's a national organization founded by some parents from the North Shore area um, who of lost Milwaukee? of Milwaukee okay. right who lost a child by suicide 
and um, these parents and educators got together and said, what, what are we doing here? Like, yes, calculus is important, but not more important than someone's mental health. So RedGen, um, it stands for Resiliency Education for the Next Generation. And we really, there's about 45 students that are in it, and we really teach um, resiliency skills, you know, how to deal with stress and anxiety, how to help your peers out when they're dealing with stress or anxiety. Um, they're all um, QPR trained, as most of our staff is, on suicide prevention. So it's just an organization that really um, works to let people know that there is there should not be a stigma to mental health challenges. I mean, when when people are ill with cancer, we're bringing people casseroles and food and and you know doing what our community does. But when someone suffers from a mental health stigma, there's kind or a mental health challenge, there's a stigma to it, and we're really working to end that. Um, and and trying to help kids. I, I have always seen during my 18 years as a high school teacher that, that stress that comes at the end of junior year mm-hmm. and rides through at minimum first semester senior year and sometimes all the way till the end. Mm-hmm. And those are the skills that I think can help. And I think that that is such a noble cause. I didn't know it had its roots here. Mm-hmm. I appreciate at least the one sign I see right outside of guidance as you get up the main stairwell that just talks about being flexible and bending. And I think it's the quote about trees bending in the wind, mm-hmm. but I could mm-hmm. be wrong, mm-hmm. um, which is just always great to walk by and see. But uh, I did not know the roots that organization had in Milwaukee. So mm-hmm. that's awesome. Thank you for yep. talking about it. I know You're I didn't welcome. have it down on our list today, but I didn't <laughs> want to misquote what you've uh, mm-hmm. all worked on. I think we are on number four. Yep. So for parents and students out there, what advice do you have about being successful as a student? Um, as one of the profile IB profiles um, states, risks are important. Healthy risks are important. So um, I always advise students and, and parents that, um, yes, GPA is important, but no, but giving up those challenging classes to save your GPA is not the route to go. Um, so, you know, over the last few years, we've really kind of buckled down on, you know, you're in this class, you signed up for this class. Yes, there's a drop ad period, but you don't drop a class five weeks in because you're failing it. Instead, take the risk, work hard, try to bring your grade up, um, challenge yourself. That um, that shows motivation. It shows grit. You know? Yeah, it shows and, definite grit. It shows growth by the end that you right. could push yourself through that challenge, even if you were not advanced at it. Right, right. And that's important. And so I always advise, you know, it's going to pay off in the long run. You know, people would rather see a 3.0 GPA with a bunch of tough classes. A bunch of tough classes than a 4.0 with not a lot of hard classes. Yeah. So um, that's my biggest advice. And and usually students pull through. Usually our students are, are amazing and usually they overcome the challenges they have as well as we alluded to this before, but they learn how to, you don't just give up. You go talk to the teacher, you see what you get tutoring, you, I mean, our staff is amazing. I mean, I always joke that a lot of, you know, I've heard over the years, a lot of staff members say they come to King because they think it's going to be easier with, you know, brighter Quote unquote, kids. Yeah, yeah, college bound kids, even though not everybody that walks through our doors has any intention to go to college, nor do they have to. Right. And right. And, um, it's not easy for no. teachers. I mean, I think you can speak to that, but these kids are a lot of work, you know? So the teachers that are here, for the, they wanna be here. And um, that's why I've never left. I just see some amazing, amazing things done by some of these students that have a lot stacked against them sometimes. So 
It's, yeah, that's I, rewarding. I think I had said it in a Mr. Doopy's episode, but I had uh, a former student that had a lot stacked against them while they were here, and we stayed in contact afterwards as she struggled to find a job and struggled to find motivation to get to college, and she put herself through college, and um, I flew down to Florida to watch her cross the stage. All of her family had died off. Her mom and her mm-hmm. grandma had raised her, and they had all passed. And I said, yeah, I, I would love to watch you mm-hmm. walk across the stage. And it was just amazing to see them motivate themselves and push through uh, to follow their dreams, not only to go to college, but to go to college for video game design. Yeah. Like to have, to be a, a creative, which I think, at least from my aspect, it's hard to teach our kids. I mean, I've got posters up right now with the Art Foundation's wall showing them that the project we ended on can lead to a job in illustration, a mm-hmm. job in animation. Mm-hmm. These are the things, as a high school teacher, I like to do. Uh, and I sometimes forget the amount of challenges kids come to in the door, but I always look up uh, and think about that particular student that I've watched over five years as she put herself through college, right. overcame adversity, and, and followed her dreams in art and, and did something awesome. And how meaningful that probably, I'm sure, was for her to have you there. I'm sure. Yeah, she um, started sending me her LinkedIn stuff yesterday. She's like, oh my God, Laura. I'm, <laughs> I didn't know that LinkedIn has all these like profile quizzes that you can take oh, to help boost your skills and your okay. resume. I said, yeah, I mean, this day and age, mm-hmm. anything's possible online. But yeah, LinkedIn is a specific tool. There's many of them, but like its goal is to get its users jobs and to help them network and become stronger candidates right. for whatever their field is. And you're going into video game design and animation Right. LinkedIn isn't putting you to the side because you're an artist. It, they're helping you as well. Right. And nowadays, too, there's a lot said. I mean, how I've seen the shift over the years from 2000 to now. Um, over the last probably 15 years, a lot of research has shown that you need the same skills in life to go straight into the workforce or go to Princeton. You need the same skills. And... Um, that that alone has been kind of a game changer because you're right, not everyone goes to college, especially with the cost of college now. Um, some students go right into the workforce and end up doing a lot better than you or I do. Mr. Zaber was talking about, or, uh, it came in with Stovall, and I won't ruin his announcement that'll happen after break, um, about a big thing that's happening to the choir and music production, but Previous to that this week, we got some new equipment in, donated from a previous student, Mm -hmm. was here at our school. I don't know what kind of student they were. I don't think they went to college in music, but have now made it in their career and wanted to give back. And Mm -hmm. our music production got a bunch of donated uh, equipment, I think five grand worth of stuff. Oh, that's amazing. That came this week, and now Mr. Stovall has all this new equipment that he's been setting up in preparation for that class next week. Yeah. Um, And it goes to show that you can go off with that grit, with those soft skills, with those dreams and that determination to get where you need to be and then it's awesome that they give back i'm actually this saturday uh taking my nephew up to meet a former student hmm. uh who was studying astrophysics okay wanted to be an astrophysicist was big into our science program here took photography with me oh. we've stayed in contact he is not an astrophysicist uh he does work in the medical field though and he started his own blacksmithing and knife making And my nephew had started to build himself his own forge, and so we're getting coffee while he's in town this week, and he's going to talk to my nephew. And one of the things he said was, I I would absolutely love to talk to you now. I want to give back. I wish there were more adults that kind of took that time and Mm -hmm. talked to us. And I'm like, those are the great soft skills that you had when you were here, and I'm glad you still have them in life and that your time at King has pushed you to uh, that opportunity, and now you want to give back to a Rufus King grad. Right. Rufus King student, sorry, Mm -hmm. as my nephew goes here, as I've said before. (laughs) Um, Yeah, all right, tangents. So yeah, that's, no, that's, um, that's been great. And we, we had some alumni come back this year too. I think I'm going to misspeak. I want to say class of 90s, no, 97, 98, I can't remember, 95, um, that donated some money to a Zenden. Yeah. You know, so Miss Video talked about it on the last episode. Yeah. So that um that I mean, the generals come back there's a lot of pride there. I mean they they definitely show back up. So And I think that's 
that's the thing that when we talk about teachers that might think they're coming to King because they think it's going to be easy, that I hope they can see while they're here that they're the students that we work with, the hard energy, the energy we put in and some of the hard times it is to teach goes into creating students that truly enjoy their experience and want to give back to the building, want to give back to the staff and the um, future Rufus King generals to kind of continue that. Right. Um, yeah, King has a rich history in 90 years almost. Right. Two more years and school. we'll be at 90 years. Right, right. A large school, but... I feel like a lot of personal connections, so which you don't always get with the big size, and we do. I mean, I, I, the number of students like I enjoy helping students too that are first generation, who you know maybe the, I was a first generation student and I didn't know what I was doing, but I had that one person that kind of mentored me through it. I don't know that I would have made it to the pathway I'm on. Yeah had I not had that support. Yeah, so. if there wasn't someone out there that gave two seconds of their day above right. and beyond. Right, yep. Miss Michael, the school counseling office is in charge of many aspects of life here at Rufus King. Can you give an overview of the different areas that you guys cover? Sure. So we really um, have three umbrellas. We have the umbrella of college and career. We have the umbrella of academics, and then the umbrella of personal, social, emotional. Um, so under college career, we do um, all those things like the academic and career planning, um, which is now a graduation requirement where they do Zello and they kind of do some career exploration. Um, we help students with the FAFSA. We help with their college apps and their essay writing and that kind of thing. Um, under academics, we work with the students that are maybe struggling or that need to uh, repeat a class and get a better grade or um, meet the graduation requirements. We work under that umbrella. And then I alluded to some of the things we do before under personal and social emotional. That's really the third umbrella um, that the American School Counselor Association has us work toward. I feel like in the past over my career that was neglected probably in the beginning of my career the most now we're trying to make it all equal As a kid right? that graduated high school in 2000 I, I agree i mean i met with my counselor maybe twice a year each year of my high school career um but I, I think it was just to make sure that my class, my course selection was on track and that I was doing all right. I don't think there was much connection for social emotional well-being. And as a, as a theater kid in mm -hmm. high school, there was plenty of drama in my life. <laughs> uh, but I do remember my counselor in college really taking that time to talk to me about how college life was going, how are my classes going, how uh, is uh, living in the dorms, that kind of stuff. And that's when I really got introduced to the idea of what um, counselors and taking care of mental health could do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's stuck with me to this day. I mean, I still uh, take that guidance and advice, but I also am open to uh, talking with a psychologist and, and taking care of my mental health to ensure mm -hmm. that I can balance work, life, being a parent, being a son, being mm -hmm. a nephew, being a friend, and, mm -hmm. and, and try to find all of the ways to, to function in life. Right. I'm still stuck on the part you graduated in 2000. I keep yes, going back I'm sorry. to that. Yeah. I am, I am so a millennial by definition. <laughs> uh, since we were the smoke-free class of 2000, as they told us in first grade, when they asked us to do a poster contest. And uh, yeah, as early as first grade, I knew that we were some kind of beacon of hope as mm -hmm. the class of 2000, just because of the millennial aspect. And then, I don't know, maybe five years into teaching, uh, my teaching career, we had some uh, guest speakers come in for a PD and they were talking about how do we help the millennials connect with the workforce. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool, yeah, I understand. My current kids, they're millennials. And then he's like, yeah, you know, anyone that graduated after 2000 and my jaw hit the floor like, no, 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 I'm not a millennial. I'm not, no, 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 there's all these negative things people are saying about millennials. Those don't apply to me. I don't think it applies to my friends. Uh, which I'm sure most generations kind of mm -hmm. try to distance themselves from where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've, I've learned to grow and, and, and appreciate and accept the mantle of being the first generation of millennials uh, out there just because I graduated in high school mm -hmm. from uh, in the year 2000. Nice. 
All right. So at the end of our interviews, I love to ask for a closing thought, a quote, or a book recommendation from my guests, just for a little uh, extra perspective on who you are and uh, to leave our listeners with something new that they might not have looked into in their lives in the event they're curious. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, years and years ago, met, was fortunate enough to meet Toni Morrison. And I met her before I read any of her work. And so after meeting her, I was like, this lady is amazing. So I started diving into her books. They're hard reads, but they're really good reads. And so I have not found a book of hers that I don't like. Um, I like them all. Um, and I also, her, I, she's so profound. And one of her quotes, and I, I hope I get it correct. If not, I'll get the idea behind it correct. But she was quoted as saying, if you're a free person, you need to free other people. Or if you're an empowered person, you need to, it's your job to empower other people. Yeah. And that's really how I see all five of us up in the counseling department and for teachers too. I mean, anyone in education or any kind of service help related field that it really, it. I don't think we, we're certainly not in this for the pay, right? We're certainly, I mean, we, we want to help. We want to empower students. It, and I think that a, a just calling as lame as that sounds, uh, especially in this day and age. Mm -hmm. But I do think uh, most of the truly gifted educators I've run into in my lifespan and my career, mm -hmm. uh, be it from just people in my life or actual teachers, uh, they have found that gift mm -hmm. of helping others to to teach others. Um, it's and, very rewarding. And it's, it's very rewarding, and I know that it's, it's a dying art, and it's a dying mm -hmm. calling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's harder and harder, as my own son had his teacher up and quit last week, Monday. Second teacher in two years. Wow. Yeah, it's a dying profession, so anyone out there, uh, as we continue to grow our CP program here at King, and if we end up having uh, an education strand to mm -hmm. uh, help train the future leaders, or the future educators of America, as some of our neighboring schools do, uh, please continue to think about joining the teaching profession if you feel you have that calling or that uh, gift to help others uh, and to teach others. Right, it's great. I love I've I love what I do. Thank you so very much for taking the time out of our workday to talk with uh, those that are out there in our community about your welcome. time and experiences at Rufus King. You're I welcome. I wish you a happy new year and happy holidays. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rufus King Nation builders. I wanted to thank you for taking the time today to listen to our 12th King's Cast podcast, introducing our community to the staff working daily in the halls of Rufus King High School to support our student generals. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Brenda Michael, one of the counselors here at Rufus King. After today's conversation, I find myself more knowledgeable on how to help our students navigate the ins and outs of not only high school, but the IB program and more motivated to help our seniors make the best of second semester. That said, please join us again next month as we sit down with another Rufus King staff member to discuss how they bring the International Baccalaureate to life in their classrooms.